Hello friends, welcome to the study of the second letter of St. Peter. St. Peter wrote his first letter to the Universal Church to encourage newly baptized Christians in the faith communities to embrace the spiritual rebirth through the living word, inspiring in them the need to remain faithful in love and to respond properly to external opposition and persecution. And now, in his second letter, Peter writes to the same communities to stress the need for mature growth in the grace and in the knowledge of Christ. And rather than writing about the external forces against Christians, he now focuses on the internal opposition caused by false teachers who introduce destructive heresies that seduce believers into error, immorality, and even to denying of Christ. With this short introduction, let us further explore the letter. The writer of the letter identifies himself as Simon Peter. He claims to have been an eye and ear witness to the transfiguration of the Lord. He presumes to speak on behalf of the other apostles who witnessed the event. He alleges to have written an earlier epistle to the same readers. He regards himself as a colleague of Apostle Paul. The second letter of St. Peter thus presents itself to us as an original composition of St. Simon Peter. Nevertheless, ancient and modern scholars alike have raised questions about the reliability of the claims and doubted its authenticity and apostolicity. Many modern exegetes still consider it a pseudepigraphical work as the first letter of St. Peter. The internal evidence, that is, evidence from the text, as we have seen, is clear. But this does not corroborate with the external evidence. It is impossible to bring forward with certainty a single explicit testimony in favor of its authenticity. The Moratorian Canon of 170 Common Era, which is of the Western Church, does not have this letter in its list of New Testament books. In the Western Church, the prominent churchmen like Origen, St. Hippolytus, were quoting and alluding to St. Peter indirectly, but Apart from these quotations and allusions, in the Western Church there is not an explicit testimony in favor of the canonicity and authenticity, apostolicity of this epistle until the middle of the 4th century. So the reason for this is twofold. First, the letter differs in style, inclining many to think that the two epistles must have come from two different authors. Second, a number of writings appeared in the second century under the name of Peter that were obviously pious forgeries. For example, Gospel of Peter, Apocalypse of Peter, Acts of St. Peter, etc with the church on guard against the proliferation of such inauthentic works, it may have taken some time to grant canonical recognition. The Eastern Church gave much earlier testimony to the letter than the Western Church. Eusebius of Caesarea, while personally accepting 2 Peter as authentic and canonical, nevertheless classes it among the disputed works. At the same time, affirming that it was known by most Christians and studied by a large number with the other scriptures. By the second half of the fourth century, many doubts about the authenticity of the letter began to disappear in the churches of the East owing to the authority of Eusebius of Caesarea and in the West owing to the authority of St. Jerome. 
It was Saint Jerome who finally brought about the admission of its authenticity. It was admitted to the Vulgate, and the Synod convoked by Pope Damasus in 382 Common Era expressly attributed the letter to Saint Peter. In the words of Saint Jerome, the two epistles attributed to Saint Peter differ in style, character, and the construction of the words, which prove that, according to the exigencies of the moment, Saint Peter made use of different interpreters. Despite the doubts that have historically surrounded the epistle, conservative scholarship continues to maintain the apostolic authorship of the Saint Peter. It is not that the difficulties of holding this position are minimized or ignored, but rather the historical and literary evidence is evaluated very differently. Therefore, in good faith, let us accept that the letter was written by St. Peter himself. Now, when was it written? The date of 2 Peter entirely depends on the question of authorship. If the letter is authentic and comes from Peter himself, then it must have been written before his martyrdom in Rome in the mid-60s. On the other hand, if the letter was written by someone impersonating Peter, then the question of dating is more open-ended. The proponents of pseudepigraphical authorship regularly claim that this letter was the last book of the New Testament to have been written. There are also scholars who date the letter as late as 140 Common Era. Now, to whom was this letter written? There are no explicit statements in the letter that specify either its place of origin or its destination. We can only infer from the content of the letter that the most likely location for its origin is Rome, the place from which Peter sent his first letter. The most likely location of its recipients is Northern Asia Minor, the modern-day Turkey. Now, let us look at the division of the book. In the first chapter, the first two verses, we have opening address and salutation. And the first chapter is entirely dedicated to the cultivation of Christian character, which speaks more about the call to virtue. The second chapter is dedicated to the denunciation of the false teachers. The third chapter is dedicated to the promised return of Christ. And then letter closes with doxology, which is much similar to the doxology of the first letter of St. Peter. Now, what is the sit sim leben? What is the situation in which the letter was written? The second letter of Peter was written to Christians dangerously exposed to an outbreak of false teaching. News had reached Peter that deceivers and scoffers have started to infiltrate missionary churches with their errors and were openly challenging orthodox faith taught by the apostles. Peter's second letter which he describes as parting words, responds to the situation both offensively and defensively. Offensively, Peter vigorously attacks both the claims and conduct of these false prophets. Their most conspicuous error was the denial that Jesus would come again in glory as the judge of the world. The apparent delay of the Christ's return was ridiculed. Many other destructive heresies were propagated as well and were used to justify and promote degenerate behavior. Far from being respectable teachers, these troublemakers, as depicted by Peter, led lives dominated by licentiousness, greed, lust, 
insubordination and irreverence towards angels. So I know where there are sins that Peter groups them together with fallen angels, the wicked generation of Noah's day, and the depraved inhabitants of ancient Sodom. The readers are assured throughout the letter that certain destruction is in store for such troublemakers. Defensively, Peter attempts to immunize his readers against deceptive ideas that could lead them astray. The best protection against error, he insists, is a firm understanding and commitment to apostolic teaching. He thus reminds them of the truths they already know and challenges them to grow still more in their knowledge of God and his ways. And to faith they must add virtue so that the truth of the gospel will shine forth through their lives as godliness. Now let me conclude this letter, this exploration with a short conclusion. Apostle Peter concludes his letter writing that Christians must be patient and cling to the promises of Christ concerning his return and maintain a state of righteousness so as to be prepared for his parousia. He also makes a final appeal to Christians to remain on guard, not to be led into error and not to stumble in faith. He urges Christians once again to grow both in grace and in the true knowledge of our Lord. And he closes the letter with a doxology, as I have already said, that is similar to his first letter. Now, let me put forward to you some questions for personal reflection. What are the dangers of false or distorted teaching? Is it prevalent in any form today? Peter warns Christians not to be deluded by what false statement concerning Christ. What is freedom that false teachers promise and where does their freedom lead? Please try to answer these questions after having read the whole letter with deep reflection. Thank you.